Well, let me put in a personal note here. I first met Ward in 2001. He had read a, a short article that I had written on National Review Online about diversity on college campuses. And out of the blue, he called me up and invited me to attend a meeting that he was planning at the Reagan Library. Um, I accepted out of curiosity and some interest. And out of that meeting at the Reagan Library came my book, Diversity, the free copies of which are available out there. Diversity, the invention of the concept, uh, of course, caused me no end of trouble. The book pretty much derailed my 20-year career at Boston University. I spiraled downward and ended up at what you see as my now currently sorry state. Thanks, Ward. <laughs> Well, seriously, at that meeting that summer at the Reagan Library, I encountered a truly remarkable public man. I hesitate to say public intellectual because Ward is much more attuned to the common currency of public debate and policy than to the kind of stuff that we put into our journals. Uh, you get the sense that he's looking through the haze of debate to discern core principles. I had never met someone quite like that at the, at the Reagan Library. He conducted, without notes and with uh, great aplomb, a wide-ranging conversation with about 20 people with political views all over the map, kept this thing moving fluidly over the course of two and a half days, um, entered without hesitation into debates on all sorts of issues and left each one of them enhanced, clarified, moved the debate forward in a manner that uh, was just breathtaking. And having spent 20 years as a professor and an administrator in a university, you would think you'd be used to all the forms of public rhetoric available, but I wasn't used to this. This was uh, something new to me and uh, uh, gave me a, just a, a deep impression and, and love for who he is and what he could do. I understood then, better than I had before, how Proposition 209 passed. It had a, a general on its side of just uh, uh, the kinds of ability that won battles for Romans and Greeks. He's a formidable debater, and you've seen that. It's really no surprise at all that the other side is scared of him, and when the other side is scared, it resorts to some pretty nasty tactics. So another aspect of Ward's character has been made manifest in these recent years. If he's not quite bulletproof, uh, he sure is capable of fending off just ferocious attacks with everything from Brit brickbats to spitballs. He, he deals with angry crowds. He deals with them graciously. He knows how to face down people who are screaming at him. He gets the sweet voice of reason heard despite the cacophony of catcalls and character assassination and other tactics I won't even mention. Well, he's here to address us in part after he receives the Sydney Hook Award. He's here to address us in a bracing time the movement to end racial preferences has just endured a tough electoral season. It was on the ballot in several states. It almost won in Colorado, but didn't. It passed in Nebraska. It went down to, I can't really call it defeat, it went down to subversion in a few other states where tactics were deployed to keep it off the ballot. But in this same season, we saw the election of Barack Obama, which suggested a proof of principle of what Ward has been saying for the last 15 years, that America seems to be ready to move beyond race, at least in some categories. So which is it? Is it the, uh, the hardcore support for maintaining the regime of racial preferences, the now rather numerous category of race experts who uh, basically owe their daily living to maintaining resentment and uh, keeping these categories alive? Or are we at this point where the nation is about to embrace a 
post-racial definition of its public life. Well, um, I hope that Citizen Ward Connerly will throw some light on this in the next few minutes. But first, to business. The National Association of Scholars has a cluster of awards that we give each time we convene nationally. One of them is named the Sidney Hook Award. I suspect Sidney Hook's a familiar name to most of us here. Uh, Hook was a leftist in the 1930s who uh, saw his way free of the allure of the then popular tendency for the left to adore, Mar uh, to adore Stalin. Um, he was a student of John Dewey and brought into play both a sophisticated mind and a kind of pragmatic sense of uh, how to lead public life. Eventually, Hooke, I think, became maybe the most prominent American intellectual who resisted the path, the totalitarian impulse, let's say, of the left. Uh, he's a hero to a great many of us, uh, founder of a predecessor organization to the National Association of Scholars. Um, and I would think perhaps the symbol of public courage that uh, uh, stands out as his most salient characteristic today. Uh, I don't know how well Hook is thriving as a philosopher anymore. Uh, his works are still read, but perhaps he remains more important to us for what he did to define public life than what he did in his academic works. The Sidney Hook Award has been given 11 times before by the NAS. Uh, some of the recipients are James Coleman, the sociologist who uh, courageously put his neck out to, uh, in the 1960s, revealed data that showed uh, some unexpected aspects of school busing and school desegregation. Gertrude Himmelfarb, the great Victorian historian, uh, Robert George of Princeton, Donald Kaplan. So this is an award that goes to illustrious company, which will be only more illustrious as we bestow on you. The very heavy. <laughs> Sydney Hook Memorial Award for vindicating the principles of fairness and merit in American higher education. Award. <laughs> 